Well, good morning. If you're watching this, that means that uh, the forecasted uh, freezing rain has come in and made travel uh, treacherous, and so we've canceled services and we're all watching from home. I'm recording this on Friday, just in case. I hope that things will pass and we'll be able to be together, but just in case we've got this message ready for you. You may be feeling this similar way. I, I've been feeling this. There's a, um, there's a certain unease that I often find at the back of my mind. It, it's just kind of this constant little what if that just pops up time and, and time again, especially when I hear something on the news. You know, that, that, that question, what, 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 if I, uh, what if I become infected with the COVID virus? Uh, what, what, what will it be... Um, a non-event? Will it be just a, a bad week? Could it be even something worse? What, what if my, my family gets it? Uh, what, what, what will happen then? What processes will be followed out? Or I think, you know, what if this, what if this pandemic isn't, isn't gone by fall? Uh, what if we're still dealing with this for, for some time? What if the, uh, the economy <laughs> gets even worse? What if, what if the government overreaches? Uh, you know, these, these just, these little things of what if, what if, what if it gets worse? What if it gets bad? What will we do? What if we, um, you know, what if we, what we saw on January 6th uh, was just the beginning of more political unrest? What if the rioters of last summer meet up with the rioters of January? You know, what, how, will things spiral out of control? You know, it just, it's just there. No, I'm not spending my days locked in a, in a darkened room, hiding out from the world. Uh, I, I really try not to give those little thoughts as they pop up much credence and much time. Um, so I, you know, I try to stay upbeat. I, I, I do my work. I, I go about my life. But when I hear a little bit of news or something, it, it, I hear that voice again. And as I thought about all of this, I wonder, well, what antidote do I need? What goes beyond just mere trying to be cheerful, trying to be positive? Is there something else there that we need? And I thought for a minute, you know, what we really need, because I know I'm not alone in this. I know our community feels this, our nation feels this. What do we need? Well, I think what we need is peace. But if we think about it, peace is really a byproduct of something else. It's the result of something what is that something else? Well, look at the, the Psalm of David in Psalm 27. He wrote, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be confident. And, and that's what I believe we're looking for, is confidence. David doesn't say that when the enemies withdraw, he'll feel peace. He says that even when there are problems, he will be confident. So confident Confidence is the antidote for our anxiety. And even psychologists bear this out. I know I'm, I'm not alone. And I know that we are not alone in the midst of history and particularly church history. People of faith have long had to contend with plagues and social unrest and political unrest and famine and economic uncertainty. And this includes the early church. The Apostle Paul reminded us about his confidence. In Philippians, he said, and remember, he's writing from jail. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. He's writing to the church in Philippi. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Why? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you see what Paul is doing? 
he is confident that God is at work, that God will complete something that he set out to do. Now, let me show you an example of, of lack of confidence. We find it in, in Matthew 8. It's a story many of us are aware of. Jesus has been teaching, and, and it says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. So he's at a lake edge. He's near the boat that they're going to use. And he said, Let, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Remember, he said that. We're, we're going over to the other side. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. And as they were going along, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples woke him and said, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. They are, they are panicked. And what we see here is that a misplaced confidence leads to distress. A lack of confidence in the right thing, the right place, the right person will lead you to distress. Remember, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And that sounded fine. Everybody was fine with that. They all got in the boat. So everything was okay until the storm came up. And then it was as if a, a competition was in play. Who would win? The storm or Jesus? Where was their confidence placed? They, they just assumed that that storm is going to overwhelm us. That storm is going to win. What was Jesus doing? <laughs> was he helping with the sails? No. Was he helping bail out water? No. Was he helping to panic? <laughs> no. He was sleeping. Why? Because his confidence was properly placed. After they roused him up, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and they asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Do you see what's happening here? In that moment when that storm is raging around them, they had to ask themselves, who do we trust? Who is more powerful, the storm or us? Well, they knew the storm was more powerful than them, but they forgot about Jesus having more power than the storm. They, they couldn't even begin to imagine it. And then he showed them that he did. That if they placed their faith in him, he would have seen them across the lake. He would see this journey to completion. Now, let me, let me give you an example of someone who does demonstrate that, that, or that confidence that we're looking for. It's also in Matthew 8. It's earlier in the chapter. It's up in verse 5 we pick up. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, and suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Now notice, he's already got the confidence in Jesus, but he's going to take it another level. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he does. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and he said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. You see, a well-placed confidence 
leads to assurance. This centurion had confidence that Jesus not only could heal his servant, but he could just heal him with a word. And so he had assurance. He didn't need Jesus to come with him. He didn't need Jesus to walk in his house. He didn't need to watch the whole process. He had an assurance that if Jesus said the word, it would be taken care of, that he would complete what needed to be completed. I think this is a good moment for us to pause and pray and to ask God to search our hearts and and say, you know, where is my confidence? Where is my assurance set? Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we ask right now that as we consider these truths from your word, help us to think about where we put our confidence. Is it in ourselves? Is it in people, in governments? and preachers, or are we putting our confidence in the right place, in the right person, or we put it in in you? As we move forward in this text, Father, help us to see something each of us needs to know, to remember, to take to heart. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So how do we get this kind of confidence that we need. Let me give you three questions to think about, to ask yourself. When you find yourself in a moment, maybe it's just one of those fleeting thoughts that makes you a little anxious. Maybe it's something that you're facing throughout the day. But three things for you to think about and get the answer. The first one is, we have to remind ourselves, what has God decreed? What what has he said would happen? If I go to Romans 8, we get a beautiful passage here. Paul is is thinking about some of the problems he's having in his life that other believers are having, and he wants to give assurance. And he says this, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face all death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither demons nor angels, neither the present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's what God has decreed. He will be with you. Nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing. He will always be there. He will always love you. And and whatever storm we face, he will be present with us. Now, God's word never says at any point that you will not face a storm, that you will not have trouble, that you will not have pain. What we have been promised, what has been decreed, is that he will be with us. We have to remember that God is at work in human history. He has a plan, and he will see that plan to completion. And if your hope is in Jesus Christ, your hope is not for a pain-free life, a problem-free life. Your hope is that there is a God who loves you and will work with you to bring you to where he wants you to be. Even, even if we are not healed in this life, we have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of resurrection. And we know, we know, we can be confident that if we become absent from this body, we will be present with the Lord. We have heaven waiting for us. We have a win-win situation. We either have Jesus now or we will be with Jesus then. So we can be confident that God has not abandoned us even when it's hard. Whatever we might face, whatever the future might bring, we will not be separated 
from the love of God. So the first question is, what has God degreed? And we just need to remind ourselves of these promises of God. Here's the second question. Who has the authority in this universe? Who has it? And this week we had the uh, presidential transition. We went from one president to the next. And I'm so thankful that it was a, a peaceful transition this past week. But if you watch the news, you know that one of the first things that President Biden did was to sign a number of executive actions and several of them to overturn executive actions that the previous president, President Trump, had signed in. It's, it's one of the things that we allow presidents to do, that there are some things that they, within their control, they can just do it. But here's the thing. They, they, they only have this kind of this four-year thing. If they just, if it's not legislation, if it's not signed into law, that legislation, that executive action, it can be swept away with someone else's pen. Whatever authority they think they have can be undone completely. There are a number of things that could happen to it, and the next president can sign it off. Congress can come up with a new law and, and uh, overwrite it. Supreme Court can weigh in. Well, they think they have a lot of power, that they have a lot of authority, but what they soon find is that it's all very limited. So who has authority? There's a story uh, about in the early 10 hundreds, a, a king in England, he was, he was Dutch, but he was king in England uh, by the name of Canute. And he was always having people come up and just tell him how wonderful he was and how much power he had. He was just kind of this omnipotent leader. Well, I don't know if the story is, is really true, but it does illustrate this, that, that, um, this idea. So what he said, he wanted his, his chair, his throne, set up right at the, the edge of the shore as the tide was coming in. And he was going to tell that tide not to come in. And so they did that. He said it there and he kept telling it, don't come, don't come, don't come. But the tide kept coming. His feet got wet. His robe got wet. His chair got wet. And the story goes that he took his crown, wouldn't wear it anymore. He put it on a, on a cross. A reminder that he was not omnipotent. He, he did not have unending power. And whether that story is true or apocryphal, it's, it's often used to remind that, 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 that our thought that we have such great power is often an illusion. But you know who does have the authority? It's Jesus. You know, if, if you go to John chapter 19, Pilate is interrogating Jesus. Jesus isn't answering him. Pilate says, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And here's Jesus' answer. You have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. You, you've got no, you think you have power, Pilate? You don't. Nothing is being done here without God's permission without his action. And Jesus said this after his resurrection, just before his ascension, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So when we, we look at all the, the rulers of the world and different people at different levels who try to exercise authority, power, we need to remember their authority and their power is limited. And that can give us confidence because the one in whom we want to trust, who can give us assurance, has the authority to act, to move history to where he wants it to go. So what do we do with on this? What, what can I do? What can you do in this? Anytime we feel that anxiety come bubbling up, you know, remembering the decrees, Remembering who has authority. Let's go to, back to that Psalm 27. A little later in that chapter, David says, I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Basically, he's saying, I, I trust that God will still do something good 
in my lifetime. Wait for the Lord, he says. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So what do we do? We wait. Now, sometimes we think wait is this very passive thing. You know, I'm just supposed to sit still until something happens. But I like the way G. Campbell Morgan put it. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. Third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. That, that we are waiting for God's commands, and as we see God's commands visible to us, we read his word, we see an application, and then we go, we act, we do. So, we know that God is doing something. We want to sync up with what he's doing, and when we sync up with what God is doing, relying on his word to guide us and direct us, gives us a confidence and assurance that God is at work, not only throughout the world, but in us. So not only do we want to wait, but we need to pray. Paul said this, do not be anxious about anything. That's easy said, right? It's easier said than done, but everything's easier said than done. But what do we do when we feel anxious? In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So pray. Pray. When, when you feel that anxiety come up, when you feel disconcerted, when you see events that are happening around you and you wonder, oh my goodness, how bad will this get? How far will they go? What's going to happen? Pray. Set a prayer time for yourself through the day. Have a conversation with God through the day. Remind yourself as you're talking to God that God has the authority, that God has a plan, that God is at work, and there is no one with the authority to thwart what God is setting out to do. Pray. Bring it before him. Not just yourself. Invite other people to pray with you over the situation and the circumstances of this world and the things that are happening in, in your life. Don't buy the lie that a hard life is an unholy life. Hang tough to the truth that there is a God who loves you, who will not allow you to be separated from his love, who will see you through, who will work things out to completion, what he is doing in your life. Trusting in that, even when it's hard, whether it's a personal problem or something happening in society, hang on to those promises of God. Put your confidence there that you might have peace that passes all understanding. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you right now that We've been able to look at your word, to be guided by it, to be comforted and yet challenged by it. And as we take time on our own to have communion, Lord, help us to see in that bread and in that cup those reminders that you have a plan. Jesus did not die a, a simple martyr's death, but he went to the cross to take our sins there, to take the, the penalty and the power of those sins and destroy them, that we might have the hope of heaven and power and purpose for life now. Thank you for this time, Lord, that we've had. And I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching. I encourage you to take some time of communion and to remember these things that God has for you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Be safe, be careful, remind yourself, nothing will separate you from the love of God. See you soon.